Where would they log from? Should I mix them with the presenter or the organizer? Yeah, so. When it comes in here. So right now it's muted? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's muted, yeah. yeah. No, we're not muted, just the, 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 the attendees are muted. But some of them will have like background sounds as well. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Right. Make. Mm. Uh, it's to get yeah. <laughs> they put up the the, the the PowerPoints as well. I'll put it up here. <clears throat> so it all like this. Put this up here. And we put it up. We're good. Thank you. You guys can hear me okay? Yeah, clearly. Good. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry, Martin. The, the seasons are very pronounced in that part of the world as well. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Yeah, fall starts in the end of August. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, was, I was reading somewhere that Vermont is one of the best places to experience fall. It says the changing colors of the leaves oh, yeah. and the seed fall. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How maintained are these seasons in terms of their, their the calendar periods. So are they remaining August to October? Or is there some type of shift? Like all oh, wet and dry season is very much intermingled now. Are they overlap? Are there changes? Mm -hmm. I would say it's still pretty defined. Okay. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it means then that the environmental changes are probably probably more effective in the tropics. I think so. Are the pools the temperate regions? For sure. Yeah. The warming of the oceans mm -hmm. impacting all the yeah. smaller land masses. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the region is is particularly predisposed. Oh, yeah, yes. this tropical council, tropical keeper and ban, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the tropical areas. Uh, it's, this year is rough. Oh. It's been really yeah. Yeah. part of destruction. And we're not through the season no, yet. We're not. We're still in September. I have a really, really good friend who grew up in mm -hmm. He's trying to get there now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but St. Martin is still trying to get to terms with things. Puerto Rico is still being affected. This sort of flooding mm -hmm. dam apparently broke its, 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 yeah. its, its, its gates. So yeah. That's not causing massive flooding at all. Yeah. 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 I think the way what we'll see in the, those northern hemispheres is that trees, different species of trees adjusting. Mm -hmm. And as they adjust and the shrubs die to them, the, that will adjust the habitat for the yeah. moving mm -hmm. <coughs> I'll probably discuss that after. After mm -hmm. transition to the how the environment and wildlife, mm -hmm. based on your experiences, are seemingly uh, um, adapting to the changes that's occurring. Because we are asked to adapt mm -hmm. and to mitigate the changes mm -hmm. as, as humans. Mm -hmm. And what, how is that being manifested in, 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 yeah. in, in the wild as well? Mm -hmm.
Yeah. We're going to start. Okay. okay. Hello and welcome back to those who have joined us thus far for a course One World, One Health, One Medicine. And welcome if this is the first time you are participating in our course. And in fact, we are very excited in the month of September to present on the topic of specifically wildlife conservation and in, indeed the theme of ecology. Throughout this course, we have engaged different perspectives of One Health, One Medicine, examining health for humans and its inextricable link with that of animals and the environment. And we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Andre Issa Pilcher and Brian Pilcher, who are professors in our wildlife and conservation and ecology program here at St. George's University. And they have traveled extensively and are very much involved in the education in the research and the practice as it relates to wildlife conservation and ecology as well. So we're very much fortunate to have our presenters for this month. And without further ado, we would like to have them share their seminar with us this month. And after the presentation, we look forward to a very instructive and exciting conversation at the same time. So I'd to take it over to you guys. And please feel free to introduce yourselves to our online community. Oh, thanks. Okay. Um, like you said, I'm Brian Pilcher. I w worked as a wildlife biologist and forester for many years in the States. And uh, I've, I've been working here at St. George's University uh, for the last nine years. I work in the biology, ecology, and conservation department. And uh, I'm a, a professor teaching mostly wildlife and biology related courses. So as he said, I'm uh, Andrea Easterkilcher, and I have a PhD in conservation biology, so I'm very interested in population genetics and population ecology, and especially long-term viability of endangered and threatened species. So um, Brian and I were on sabbatical for the fall of 2015, and we were invited by Russian colleagues and friends to spend time in Russia as visiting scientists, which we did. Our journey took us to Lake Baikal, and I have lectured about Lake Baikal mostly because of the huge numbers of endemic species found there for 20 years now, so to go was a real treat. And then we went to nature preserves in Kamchatka, and finally we spent five weeks in the Sikodaline Biosphere Reserve with a side trip to the land of Leopard National Park, which we will talk all about uh, that today. So the director of the Sikotaline Biosphere Reserve, and that is the last stronghold of the Amur Tiger, is our Russian son, so to speak, and it is his parents with whom we originally collaborated on a reintroduction project of beavers into the Volga Kama National Nature Preserve uh, near Kazan in Russia. Dmitry, their son is the director of the Sikotaline Biosphere Reserve, and he actually lived with us in Montana and completed his undergraduate wildlife biology degree from our University of Montana Western Wildlife Biology program while living with us. He went on to complete his doctoral degree from the University of Moscow in Russia, and um, so he was very helpful in terms of facilitating our visit to Russia. We were welcomed everywhere we went as visiting scientists. We trekked out in the field with biologists studying amur leopards, amur tigers, musk deer, migratory birds. So today, while we are only going to scratch the surface, we are really happy that you all have joined us for our travels in the Russian Far East, Lake Baikal, Kamchatka, and land of the tiger. So as we have found in the past, Siberia and the Russian Far East exhibit ornate beauty in their architecture. This is a Russian Orthodox cathedral um, in the Baikal region, and as well as very quiet and beautiful simplicity um, in the Russian villages. Each Russian village has an artist that is dedicated to painting the window trims in a particular style distinctive to that village. And this particular home is in the Baikal region. Um, typical apartment complexes is where the majority of Russian people live. This particular apartment block is in the Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky area in uh, Kamchatka. So we were really focused on protected areas 
in Russia. And this is an example or this of the uh, exhibit that Russia displayed at the World Parks Congress, which is held every 10 years in Sydney, Australia. It was held in 2014. Russia's exhibit showcased landscape and ecosystem biodiversity as conserved in their national parks and nature preserves. Okay, so this map shows um, uh, Zapovinics, which are special protected areas that uh, I'll describe more uh, later, and um, also uh, Zakoznics and, and national parks across Russia. Okay, so they have a number of different kinds of protected areas, um, just like we have in the States and other places in the world. Uh, some of the names look familiar, like National Park, uh, and yet they're managed much differently from what we call national parks in, in the States. Uh, national Park uh, might encompass some uh, rural villages. There could be some uh, very protected places where uh, people can't go in without permits. Uh, and um, then there could be uh, other areas that are more like our national parks. Uh, I, on the whole, I would say that they're more like our uh, U.S. national forests, which are uh, you know, managed under multiple use. Uh, the Zapovedniks, I especially want to point those out. They're very strictly protected. People can't go in uh, unless uh, they have an, a, a permit for educational use or scientific purposes. Uh, there were 101 of those existing in 2015. Okay, so let me get you oriented here. Uh, Russia, huge place, covers 11 time zones. Now, they've consolidated some time zones, and so if you were to count them, you wouldn't see 11 there now, but um, 11 out of 24 time zones around the world, so it uh, nearly goes 180 degrees uh, around the world. Uh, the Urals are in through here, the Ural Mountains, and they divide Europe from Asia. Um, we spent our time on this last trip over here. Before, when we got, when we worked with our collaborators, we were more over uh, east of Moscow, between Moscow and the Urals at, at Kazan, at a, uh, a Zapovednik there. So we were um, here on the east coast of Japan, at the Japan Sea. Uh, we were at Lake Baikal and we were on the Kamchatka Peninsula uh, up here. So the per first uh, preserve was set aside in 1916 to protect this gorgeous animal, the sable, whose populations had crashed across the Russian Far East due to the fur trade. They have recovered. They are now a rough estimate of 1.1 million sable across the Russian Far East. And they are listed by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature as least concern at this point. So, and as in the past, we found new Russian colleagues and friends to be more than gracious and welcoming. Here we are with the director on my left um, of the Baikalsky Preserve at Lake Baikal, Vasily Suchila, and the deputy director of science, Irina Kozul, as well as one of the local doctors who his specialty was making homemade vodka, which he brought to the lunches that we had with him. So this is on the shores of Lake Baikal, Irina Kozul, who is the deputy director of science, and then Vladimir Volodya standing behind me. He is an ornithologist and he um, was our guide. So Lake Baikal is called the Pearl of Siberia. It is a UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization World Heritage Site. It is frozen from January to May. Um, the Baikalsky Preserve is located. Oh, excuse me, you're looking for a pointer here. Yep, uh, right. Nice call speed. There, Bicalski so we spent time preserve. there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we also went up to the Salinga Delta, and we'll talk about that. Okay. Now, this map was in the uh, museum, Lake Baikal Museum in Lisbianca. It shows seismic activity. Uh, Lake Baikal is in a rift, uh, which is uh, where continental plates are pulling apart much like the Rift Valley in, in Africa. Um, and this is up to 11 kilometers deep, uh, the deepest rift in, in the world. 
Um, some of it's filled in with sediments, uh, but the lake is still a, a mile deep. Uh, but this, the, uh, these symbols on here indicate uh, the magnitude of the earthquakes. Uh, reminds me a lot of the, what you'd see along the uh, Pacific Rim of Fire or around Yellowstone Park uh, with a lot of seismic activity. And it's very active. Okay, so Lake Baikal, a few statistics. Uh, it's about 400 miles long, uh, about a mile deep. Uh, it has 20% of the world's fresh water in it. Um, it's, uh, there's 3,500 species here of plants and animals, and two-thirds, two-thirds of them are endemic. In other words, not occurring in any other region of the world. Um, so uh, quite, quite the unique place. Uh, it's a, the lake is about 25 million years old. Um, I, I just want to jump in and say that there was a, a huge source of pollutants into this lake. It, there was a large pulp mill that was dumping in, but it has been um, sh shut down as of about now, about eight years ago. Um, however, the lake is currently threatened by a proposed massive dam to be built in Mongolia on the Selenga River. And we'll talk about that later. Okay, so uh, again, this comes from another exhibit in the Lake Baikal Museum, but in the lower left, uh, there's some comparisons of uh, some depths of some lakes. Um, there's uh, Baikal, which is, uh, which is a mile deep, 1,600 meters deep. Uh, Lake Tanganyika, which is 1,500 meters deep. And then Lake Superior, just for comparison, 300 meters deep. Uh, over here, you have some volumes of uh, various lakes. Um, with uh, Baikal being the largest freshwater lake. Now, they show the Caspian Sea here, but it's not, uh, it's not a freshwater lake. There is part of it that's fresh. Uh, overall, it's, it has uh, about the third uh, of the salinity of, of seawater. Um, but it's, uh, let's see, I think I have a figure here. Oh, it's 23,000 cubic kilometers of freshwater in Lake Baikal. So um, this is, again, this is the Deputy Director of Science. And, and in Russia, lunch goes better at least with some beer. And um, with the doctor joining us for lunch, there was also homemade vodka on the table, which was quite, quite wonderful. Um, Irina Kozul took us um, after this lunch to the Baikal Museum on the southern end of the lake. And we'll talk about that. Oh yes, have to introduce you to Olga. Uh, she was our tour guide at uh, the Lake Baikal Museum, <clears throat> uh, taking on rather a stern posture here. Uh, but this lady knew her stuff, and uh, she was just a, really a tremendous tour guide. I think in this picture, maybe someone had a wrong answer. Um, but uh, anyway, actually we loved her. She loosened up after a bit, uh, led us behind some of the barriers and, and uh, some of the exhibits and things. and. Uh, really gave us a great tour. Here she's talking about that seismic map that uh, that I was I was showing you. So there are 350 species of amphipods in Lake Baikal. Many of them exhibiting exhibiting gigantism, which is something that you find sometimes in isolated areas. Uh, the most diverse invertebrate groups were the turbularian ter worms, the flatworms. There were a lot of freshwater snails, amphipod crustaceans. The largest benthic biomass was um, sponges. So there is an endemic zooplankton that actually makes up about 80 to 90 percent of the biomass. But the most popular organism in Lake Baikal is the freshwater seal, the NERPA, and it is endemic. Um, it is thought that in prehistoric times, the Lena River and the Arctic Ocean and Baikal were one integral system, and the seals arrived via that river. Chromosome analyses uh, do support the Arctic seal, sea seal as being Lake Baikal seal's closest relative. The Nerpa can dive to 300 meters. The population currently is approximately 100,000 seals. So it might not surprise you to to know that the indigenous peoples um, do use the pelts of the seals as bags. And you can maybe see that from this picture. 
These seals feed on Gola minyankas, and these are uh, an oil fish that is endemic to Lake Baikal. So 80% of the NERPA diet is based on feeding on these fish. There's a face-on view, and then we have a little um, video. So Lake Baikal harbors um, an endemic species of sturgeon, and of course that provides eggs for caviar. There is an endemic whitefish called the Lake Baikal omul, and this is actually the best tasting fish I think we've probably ever had. There are endemic sculpins. Um, 32 species of the fish are known, and 30 of these are endemic. This is a photo of one of the endemic sculpin. Um, these are Golomnyankas, large and small oil fish, and they're only found in Lake Baikal, so they do not typically exceed uh, 10 inches. They're translucent. They have no scales. They contain 35 percent of medicinal oil, which is rich in vitamin A. So it's the most numerous fish in Baikal, 150,000 tons by weight. And it is the only fish in the region that is viviparous, so it bears live young. These fish make up the vast majority of the NERPA's diet. So we did go hiking in the backcountry in Lake Baikal, and um, we did a three-day trek into the mountains, and we got out of the 10-inch fish size and moved into some rather larger organisms. So this is my size 9 women's boot beside the front foot of um, a, a uh, brown bear. This is, again, this is my boot beside the hind foot of a brown bear. Then we went on and spent some time in the Selenga Delta. Um, it is a designated Ramsar International Wetland Site. Um, it is especially focused on waterfowl habitat and the conservation and sustainability of wetlands in that area. So this is a picture of the Selenga Delta, the um, primary feeding source in the Lake Baikal. The Selenga tributaries drain 80% of the lake's watershed. There are 44 species of red-listed, rare and endangered plants, and 31 listed animals found in the delta. So seismic activity is quite high, and the sediment in Baikal reaches a few kilometers. Um, so far, the Selenga River remains undammed, but as I mentioned, there is a threat of a dam uh, farther up the river. The human population in the 26 vill villages that surround this delta is about 15,000. So um, we did take a trip out into the delta. We spent a couple of nights out there, and uh, so into the Federal Kabansky Reserve. This was formed in 1974 to preserve the unique ecosystem of the delta. It is about 12,000 hectares in size. It was placed in Baikal State Nature Reserve in 1985, and in 1994 it was named a Ramsar site due to its importance in terms of bird migrations and nesting. So there are millions of waterfowl that pass through the Selenga Delta and utilize it for stopovers and rest periods during migration and also as a nesting area. So we've got a little footage uh, uh, going on a boat ride uh, in the Delta. So we, we went out to a research station um, and spent a couple of nights out there. And this is just to give you sort of an idea of the expansiveness of the Delta and the wetlands. This reminds me of my trips in the, uh, the Mississippi Delta and also in the uh, Chafalaya River Basin, the swamps in uh, Louisiana. Uh, 
Okay, so here we just ran into a little problem. The uh, weeds wrapped around the prop and just have to stop and reverse the motor to uh, get the weeds off. So, as I said, this is an important area for migratory birds. So there are, they estimate, 5 million migratory birds stopping over in the fall, 170 different species utilizing this Baikal habitat. Um, so we did see um, quite a few birds. Um, the breeding population here of Anatidae, ducks, geese, and swans ranges from 18,000 to around 140,000. Um, we did go birding, and we saw lots of different waterfowl. We saw white-tailed eagles and marsh hawks. We spent a couple of days on the Salanga Delta, as I mentioned, with the deputy director of science, Irina, and ornithologist, Yuri, and a couple of rangers. And we thought this was really interesting, the pathway to the bird observation tower, camouflaged uh, and built by twigs. So this is looking back at it from the observation tower. And then we are eating fresh omul here from Baikal with the ornithologist Yuri. Um, and this really was pretty fabulous. Yuri runs a, a birding station, a, a significantly large birding station on the shores of Baikal. His mist nets were hundreds of feet across and some in, in large squares and, and Anyway, he is, he is pulling birds out of those nests and banding them um, by the tens of dozens every day. Okay, so from Lake Baikal, we uh, uh, flew through Vladivostok and on up to uh, Kamchatka, uh, that long peninsula on the east side of Russia there. Um, land of fire and ice, and uh, we'd say big bears too. Uh, notice the, if you hadn't noticed before, um, they use the Cyrillic alphabet in, in Russia. Uh, I can remember the first time going there and couldn't even pronounce words. Uh, it was uh, really quite an uh, unsettling thing at first. Okay, so once again, uh, orient to orient you, uh, we were had just been at Lake Baikal, flew through Vladivostok, and then on up to uh, Kamchatka Peninsula here. Um, it's part of the Ring of Fire, the Pacific Ring of Fire. There's 160 volcanoes uh, on Kamchatka, and uh, 29 of them are considered to be active. Um, and there were, at the time that we were there, there were four erupting at, uh, at one time. Um, this is uh, Lake uh, Volcano uh, Koryaski at uh, uh, Petropavlovsk. Kamchatsky, uh, the, the capital of the region, uh, right outside of town there. In fact, there's three volcanoes right out, outside of town. This one erupted in 2008 and, and 2009. And so much of the peninsula is uh, only reachable by helicopter. Uh, so to get to the ne our next preserve, uh, we, we took one of those large helicopters. They carry 24 passengers. Okay, so this is the area where we were in, the Kronatsky Reserve. Uh, you can see some volcanoes uh, scattered around here. Um, and a little closer view of the area that we visited. Uh, there was the Valley of Geysers in here. Uh, there's the Uzan Crater here, uh, a former volcano. And then there's the Valley of Death over here, which we'll talk about. This was our guide. Uh, we call him Slava for short. That's what he liked to be called. Uh, excellent command of English, great cook. Uh, so he was uh, with us for uh, a number of days while we were in the area. Um, and he was our field guide. Uh, we really, really enjoyed him. Uh, he had been a preserve employee, uh, but two years ago, to, well, two years before, or a year before we got there, he had decided to go out on his own and, and do private guiding. Uh, he was extremely resourceful. And everywhere you go there, uh, you've got to have protection from the bears. And so this is a 12 gauge, um, 12 gauge shotgun. I was really surprised to see that it was made by the Russian American Firearm Factory in Illinois. Um, I never had heard of that before. 
uh, and I know a little bit about firearms. Uh, so anyway, anyway, we were glad that uh, he had the gun. Uh, we, there were bear tracks everywhere. And this is the Valley of Geysers. Um, unfortunately, uh, part of the, the uh, seismic features were, not seismic, but uh, thermal features, uh, were covered up by some landslides, and, uh, but they're starting to, to reemerge. So uh, this Valley of Geysers was discovered in 1941 by a woman named Tatiana Ivanovna Ustinova. And she's shown here on her Mongolian ponies with her guide. And the story is that they had been trekking for quite a while and they stopped by the stream to have lunch and they're sitting on the side of the stream and they're eating lunch and all of a sudden a geyser, shoot, they hadn't yet seen a geyser, shoots out from across the, the stream straight across at them. And that's how this was discovered. So oh, oh, excuse me, just, just one note here. Okay, so uh, just to give you a clue of how remote this area is. Uh, this, this second largest concentration of thermal features in the world was just discovered in 1941. So here are just some of the thermal features there. Small geyser. Some more geysers, a beautiful mud pot. And then we um, decided to hike, bushwhack really, uh, over to the Valley of Death. And it's named that because once in a while, an accumulation of lethal gases occurs, and people that hike back there find dead animals periodically. But yet, we, we decided that that would be a good place to go. Uh, and uh, sh shortly after leaving the, the main, um, oh, what would you say, the main uh, lodge there, uh, we passed by this huge landslide that had just happened a couple of years before and uh, it nearly wiped out the, the lodge. Um, and if you look back here, um, you, can, you can see the lodge here. You can see uh, where uh, there's some remains, whoops, remains of the, uh, the landslide that ran out through here and through here. Uh, fortunately, it just destroyed a generator. Uh, then also there was, um, a mudslide down this down this river, and the lodge is right in here. And you can see where that uh, landslide just stopped short. It had run down the hill and just stopped short of the lodge facilities in, in here. Uh, so it was being assaulted on all sides by uh, mudslides and landslides. Some tremendous terrain there. Uh, the landscape is just fantastic. Uh, uh, lots of um, tundra, uh, sh shrubs, and uh, and then everywhere you look, there's volcanoes. The volcano there and there and there. And uh, this snow was from we were. This was the end of August or early September. This snow was from the previous winter, and for this year, it wasn't going to melt before the next winter came on. So we got it up into the high sort of alpine tundra on this our way to. Valley of Death, and um, this just want to show you some of the some of the photos because the colors were just stunning. It was fabulously beautiful, open, wild, and beautiful. There was abundant lichen, lots of plants from the Ericaceae family, vaccinium, blueberries, heathers were abundant, a dwarf shrub, alpine bearberry, which is Arctostaphylus alpinia, which is like our in the United States, Arctostaphylus uva ursi, and other types of vacciniums, linion berry, and a type of low bush cranberry, just with beautiful colors across the across the landscape. So this is Brian checking his GPS coordinates. Uh, the volcano on the right is Krashenikov, and it's about 6,000 feet in dormant, and the volcano to the, uh, well, that was the one on the left, the right is Kikitshipuk, which is 5,000 feet. And dormant, and I probably mispronounced that. <laughs> so, as it was the case in Baikal, there was lots of bear sign. Um, this was the biggest bear scout, bar none. And I worked two years snare trapping and radio tracking grizzly bears. I've worked a lot with grizzly bears. I've never seen a scat this size. So there again is my size nine boot against this uh, Kamchatka 
their staff. Yeah, in the states, um, to de to determine whether it's a black bear or a grizzly bear, the general rule of thumb, talking about scats, is that if it's a quarter more in volume, uh, then it's typically a grizzly bear. Wow, I'd say there's a there's a couple of quarts there anyway. Yeah. So this is just uh, one of the plants, this dwarf, beautiful dwarf arctic willow, which is about six to eight inches in height. And I just thought it was beautiful. Uh, and here's another view of that uh, mudslide that had come down the, the river. And uh, lots of areas of uh, shrublands. Uh, this is dwarf Siberian pine. Very difficult to get through unless you uh, find some little openings. Uh, uh, there are uh, lots of alder and willows and um, birch, uh, stone birch. It uh, can be very difficult uh, terrain to traverse. So we're, this is shoulder high, so we're bushwhacking with our packs through this shoulder high Siberian pine, dwarf pine, and it was difficult looking so forward to getting to our final destination for the night at the Valley of Death. Yes, we were venturing to the Valley of Death, and uh, here was our destination. Okay, so um, uh, that little platform on top of the, the, the building there, that was the observation platform that the ornithologist uh, used when he was doing bird research here. Um, Wow, I just don't even know how when it was new it would hold anybody up there. Uh, they built this new platform here now. Uh, when we ran inside this thing, uh, we were brushing rat droppings off the tables and the sleeping platforms, and uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a true wild experience. But I will say Slava made a really lovely cheese soup. <laughs> no, that was phenomenal. <laughs> Sitting among rat droppings, eating this wonderful cheese soup. Uh, just another view of the landscape there, another volcano in the background. Uh, then we made it back to the um, um, back to the main lodge and the thermal features in the Valley of Geysers. And we oh uh, also we got uh, weathered in there uh, for for three or four days, and uh, we, we were supposed to have headed right on over to the Uzan crater. Uh, but we were stuck. Uh, there were, weren't any helicopters flying except one small one happened to uh, to make it there. And uh, we managed to pay the pilot uh, when the clouds lifted just a little bit to uh, to get us over to Uzan. Okay, so then this is the Uzan Ranger Station. It's in a, a, a large crater there. Um, you can see part of the rim of the crater in the background. You'll see some more pictures here. The rim, those mountains again in the background are part of the rim and the, uh, the watery areas there, uh, lots of thermal features in there. This is in the floor of the, the crater. Uh, there's a boardwalk out through here for tourists. They fly tourists in here and they take a little hike uh, for an hour or so and then they fly out. Lots of bear sign. So again, the colors were beautiful. We've got, I mean, really the red was this bright. Uh, the Uzon bunchberries, Vaccinium heather, again, the low bush cranberries just was stunningly beautiful, the ground cover. Bunchberry leaves, heath and blackberries, as Slava called this. Um, dwarf Cornell bunchberry mixed with heath. And this great photo of bears not knowing which way they Oops, wanted to go. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So, which way do we go here? Um, and just another uh, photo of the Uzon. So this is within this giant caldera. Um, the landscape, we've got ferns and birch in the foreground and in the background, bunchberry and vaccinium. So just, just stunningly beautiful. I have a dear friend who is a geologist and she collects sand from all over the world. So. Slava went down to the shores of this lake within the caldera to collect volcanic sand for Dr. Sheila Roberts. And uh, the best meal that we had in Kamchatka, at least for me, uh, were these Russian pancakes, which were homemade. I can't tell you how much butter was put in there. And I freshly made syrup with the berries that um, 
these student volunteers that shared the ranger station for a couple of nights with us um, that they had picked and they made this for us. It was fabulous. Okay, so um, we finished up our visit there. Uh, we were going to head back to civilization. Uh, we, um, the preserve uh, director managed to arrange a technical flight for us, which is a uh, service helicopter that uh, brings in staff and uh, supplies uh, into the into the lodges. So we were able to hitch a ride in that, and we flew by a, an erupting volcano, uh, Kerminsky. And um, uh, so that was, uh, I was glad we were able to have that experience. Yeah, it's erupted every year since 2001. Okay, so again, weather was kind of, was plaguing us, and uh, we had some time while we were waiting to fly to the uh, southern end of Kamchatka. Uh, so we uh, took a tour around Abacha Bay near um, uh, PK, I'm going to call it, the capital of the area. So we, um, on this tour, we saw a lot of uh, tufted puffins, and their bills are serrated, and there's an extra bone in their jaw that prevents the fish from falling out. So the record, who knows who took this record, but is 83 sand eels in one carry. Um, so we toured around a seabird colonial nesting site, and as we got closer, we could see the, the pairs of gulls um, in the colony. And then as we headed back, you know, twilight fell and it was just beautiful, this rugged Kamchatka coast. So uh, this is uh, in the background here, you've got really Chuk uh, volcano. Now it looks like it's erupting there, but actually it's, um, it's inactive. It's just a, a, a large geyser uh, near the top there that's uh, letting off steam. Another view of the same volcano. Once again. So then we uh, finally, we, really, this was the very last shot we had at going to this preserve in the southern tip of Kamchatka. And we actually are, we were able to hitch a ride with another group that was going just as one rainstorm came and left and another was coming. Um, so this nature preserve is um, just has an abundance of wildlife. In the wintertime there are three to seven hundred stellar eagles, you know, 150 to 200 sea eagles, golden eagles, bald eagles, all kinds of mammals, sable, fox, wolverine, uh, mink, marmots, snow sheep, and then of course whales, dolphins, sea lions. Um, but we'll re we really, as a bear biologists, what we really were interested in, of course, were the um, Kareel Lake brown bears. And so um, these are spawning grounds for Pacific salmon, chum, coho, humpback, and up to six million individual salmon enter Kareel Lake. Spawning occurs March to September, and of course that draws the bears. And so this is a great place to observe bears. Um, Kamchatka brown bears have been reduced throughout Kamchatka in certain pockets, but still there are about 20,000 bears uh, remaining. These guys can reach a size of uh, 1,500 pounds, 700 kilograms, and the home range is pretty variable uh, depending on the nutrients available to the animals, so it can be as small as 12 square miles, it can be as large as 1,100 square miles. Um, so they can be up to nine feet in length. And look at this fat boy. They are healthy, wow. fat. I mean, that salmon diet is full of fat and protein for these guys, and they're very healthy. Plus, they have the Siberian pine nuts, blueberries that we've talked about, the cranberries, all of that. Um, so they're very healthy. Um, this is a source of revenue for Kamchatka uh, bear viewing, and they fence the tourists out, in and the bears out. So um, 
there's just a very thin electrical strand, as you can see there, separating the tourists from the bears. And again, there's another volcano in the background here. Um, this is a mom with nursing cubs of the year. Uh, females here uh, can reproduce as early as four years of age because the nutritional standard is pretty good for these bears. Two to three cubs per litter is standard. Um, the Wildlife Conservation Society has radio collar data that indicates that females with cubs often steer clear of salmon streams because of the concern of confrontation with adult males who could easily kill the cubs. So the trade-off for them is a little loss of nutrition or the death of their cubs. Um, however, the main threat to Kamchatka bears um, continues to be there's three, uh, poaching and habitat loss and overharvest. So this is Fishing, um, hunt, hunting for uh, brown bears in Kamchatka is permitted under a quota system. It's not very well enforced. Trophy hunting, illegal and legal, targets the largest males. Um, and as many as 300 can be removed from the population annually. And like tigers in the Primori region of the Russian Far East, the result of removing those large males is that the general size of bears has been reduced over the years. And just as an aside, the profits from this typically leave the region. So these bears are also impacted by roads built for oil, gas, and mineral exploration. And those roads provide access to poachers. So, so this is a, a behavior that I had not seen Me neither. with the bear research as these bears are fishing and we have a little video of the bears fishing for salmon. This is just a photo of females with her young cubs of the year. They're begging for some of her salmon. We were on this causeway and a female and three cubs came to join us. They wanted to join our salmon viewing and um, they were chased off by a guard. But the female, when we got off the causeway, the female came back. She got a really nice salmon. And you can see in this photo, she has three cubs. The two in the front are quite healthy, good size. The one lagging behind is smaller, scrawnier, and he's the one that was putting some effort in. The two big ones are up there on the causeway, just kind of watching. The little one is down there trying to get food uh, from the female. And so that's, this is twilight in Kamchatka with the volcano and the helicopter. And uh, we're going to move on now to the Biosphere Reserve. Okay, so uh, we're just leaving Kamchatka here and uh, heading back down to Vladivostok uh, down here where we're going to take a 12-hour uh, car ride uh, up to the Sikotalin uh, Preserve on the east coast up, up here. So there are a number of rare species that are unique to uh, this area. Um, I'm not going to list all of these, but Amur maple, Manchurian maple, Siberian ginseng, Siberian larch. We also get uh, Sika deer, uh, Eurasian lynx, yellow-throated marten, a very interesting animal that I'll touch on a little bit later, long-tailed goral, reindeer, of course brown bear, Himalayan black bear, Amur leopards, and of course the uh, Siberian or the Amur Tiger. Okay, so this is the Siko Delin Preserve with the Sea of Japan over here. Um, there's an inner boundary here that um, is the Zapovednik proper. Uh, again, that's an area where uh, you have to have a permit to, to go into it. But then there's uh, these Zapovedniks typically have a buffer area around them, and that's that's shown by this dash line here. Uh, and between those two boundaries, uh, people can 
uh, gather berries and uh, there's some other activities are, are allowed. Uh, there's also a marine protected area along the along the coast here too as, uh, as part of that. So um, one of the first trips we took from the Biosphere uh, Preserve was um, to the land of Leopard National Park, which is quite close by. Um, so we wanted to go out, and we had been invited to go out with some of the Amur Leopard biologists. So the Amur Leopard is considered to be one of the most critically endangered cats, well, the most critically endangered cat in the world, one of the most critically endangered mammals in the world was somewhere between 35 and 50 remaining in the wild, all in one isolated population in the Russian Far East in this national park. Yeah, let me back up here just, okay, so that that park is, is right down here adjacent to uh, North Korea and China. So these leopards are well adapted to living in harsh cold climates of this range. They have a very thick coat. They weigh up to, they can get to be about 115 pounds. So this is the landscape of the Amur leopard. Um, the original range of the leopard included all of the Amur Basin, mountains of northeastern China, and the Korean Peninsula. And now they're just in this one location. So we did go out a few times with the um, Amur leopard biologists, and um, this is a leopard lookout rock, so they prefer this temperate forest habitat with good cover with lookout points like this, and then caves for denning. So um, this is, I am here in a cave with um, Dina, who has become our good friend. She was the deputy director of science, and she's a passionate leopard biologist. So the Amur leopard has been systematically hunted out of most of its former range for its coat and for the bones that are used in traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, the roe deer and the sika deer make up the majority of this leopard's prey, um, but they have also been greatly depleted, and so that leads these few leopards that are left to look to domestic livestock, and you can imagine then the issues um, that that causes and leads to further persecution of the cats. This was a new cave site that we discovered and so we were putting up camera traps and checking camera traps that were already up, looking, at, looking for images of different cats. We collected scats and that all would be measured later, looked at to see what, uh, what the animals were eating. This is an Amur leopard track, so this is much, much smaller than those bear tracks that we were looking at earlier. Um, this is Victor, who was the expert at setting up capture cameras, and we were always joking with him about being the Steven Spielberg of capture camera trapping and filming of these leopards. So while we were there, um, these leopards uh, that are really extremely, because of their small numbers in one isolated habitat, they're really vulnerable to what we call environmental stochasticity of wildfire or disease could easily wipe out most, if not all of them, and poaching remains a constant threat. So this leopard was in, and they allowed us to, brought us to visit this um, rehab center. So he had been caught in a snare, and he'd lost three toes on his right front foot, and he was recuperating from that injury. So the, there was a big debate going on amongst the biologists as to whether he should be you know, sent to a zoo and used strictly for breeding purposes or whether he should be set free and have him contribute to the population in a more natural way. The director of the preserve, the Amur Leopard Reserve, really wanted to release him, but they had to test to see if he could actually capture prey. So. Um, so while we were there, they, they tested that theory. They brought a live, good-sized male, Sika deer. He arrives in a pickup truck. And uh, then they uh, released him into the pen where the Amur Leopard was. Um, Oops, sorry about that. And we have a little footage. You have to look really closely because the deer is released. And you can see him looking, he's very alert. He can smell the leopard immediately. And the, um, so we're just watching as the deer 
The deer comes out, he's moving out, but he stops. He knows this is not good. And there's, and there's the leopard. So he actually was able to um, bring down that male Sika deer, and so they did uh, release him back into the wild. There's this wonderful celebration of the tiger that happens each year. Uh, they call it Tiger Day in Vladivostok. Uh, Wildlife Conservation Society uh, started this. Uh, Adele McKell, uh, he um, said the first year there were only 20 people there and now there are thousands and it's just a wonderful celebration. You can see people really get dressed up for it. Um, These are just faces in the crowd at uh, Tiger Day. There are several indigenous tribes in the Russian Far East living and sharing their landscape very well uh, with tigers and they have a vested interest in the health of the tigers. This is the parade moving past a beautiful Russian Orthodox Cathedral. This is looking down towards the harbor. This parade is taking place in Vladivostok. And then you can see there are thousands of people. This is the IFA, International Fund for Animal Welfare Group. We were walking with uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society. So a lot of the NGO conservation groups in the area, um, they, uh, they sponsor some schools to, to go and uh, the, the, the uh, students wear their t-shirts and things. And, uh, so it gets, it gets quite colorful. Okay, so then from Vladivostok, we went back up to um, the uh, Sikotalin Preserve. Uh, the headquarters is in a small village of Terni, uh, which is at the outlet of a river on the Sea of Japan. And uh, we stayed in the WCS, or um, uh, Wildlife Conservation Society headquarters. Uh, great facilities, uh, great view overlooking the river flowing into the Sea of Japan there. Uh, after some of our uh, accommodations in the Far East, um, uh, we really appreciated this headquarters, quite comfortable. Uh, the coast is really rugged there, just like along Kamchatka. Uh, there is, I mentioned before, there's a marine protected area along the coast there. Uh, some more of the coast and uh, looking down the coast with the Sea of Japan on the left and a freshwater lake on the right and uh, looking into the Sikotalin uh, preserve here. So um, this was probably for me, uh, this was the most exciting piece of the trip was to be able to go out, to be invited to go out, to participate in some of the tiger research that was, um, was going on. Um, this is the largest subspecies of tiger. Males weigh up to 660 pounds. Length is around seven feet with a tail that's like an additional meter in length. And this is a quote from Dale McHale, who has been working in Turney for the past 20 plus years. He is the alpha Amur tiger biologist. He says, the Siberian tiger is actually misnamed as it actually occurs almost exclusively in an area of Russia called the Far East. From my house in the small village of Turney, I look out on the Sea of Japan and behind me, I am surrounded by tiger habitat stretching hundreds of kilometers to the west. So um, this is, we want to point out the Kramorsky Krai, the Sikotalin Mountains. There's the Sikotalin, and here are the, uh, the mountains, Sikotalin Mountains. And Krai is um, kind of like a state. Um, it's a government region, okay, Kramorsky. So, so the original Tiger Range, 1800s, is all of the beige that you can see on the map. And then uh, the current range is that darker right around. Um, I have a little trouble with colors, so. Right, that's um, it. Right through here. Yeah, right mm -hmm. through there. So that's what's left of the Tiger Range. Oh, excuse me, just a moment. While we're here on this map, um, uh, there's that um, Leopard National Park down, down here yeah. um, with Vladivostok here and China. 
uh, right along the border of that and, and also North Korea here. Okay. Yeah. So for tigers, uh, the three horsemen of the apocalypse, for Amber tigers, and truly for a lot of our endangered, what I call the charismatic megafauna in Russia and globally, poaching, habitat loss and habitat fragmentation, and here for tigers it's timber extraction, and loss of prey, and often that is due to poaching, the prey themselves are being poached. So in this map that you see, this is what's remaining of this tiger habitat. Um, the green is the intact Korean pine broadleaf forest. The orange is what has been degraded by logging between 1952 and 2012. So it's no surprise that the population dynamics, this is a, a slide courtesy of Dale McKell, but you can see the, the decline in uh, productivity, which is uh, uh, reproductive rates. Um, it was interesting because we uh, went to, as part of our trip, we went to a conference. So there were in biologists, tiger biologists from India, and they were meeting with the tiger biologists um, for, uh, from Russia, the Amur tiger biologists. And um, so there's a real difference in um, range size, but this is looking at area requirements for tigers in Russia. These female tigers are territorial. If you look at the different colors, these are specific individual female tigers in their territories. And Amur female average home range size is about 400 kilometers squared. And in India, that's about 20 kilometers squared. They have a much, much better prey base. So a population of 30 adult females, which we really wouldn't really even call a viable population, but it's given what numbers we have, that's not bad. Um, in India, that would take 600 kilometers squared, and in Russia, 12,000 kilometers squared. So you just can see the difference in what kind of management that would, that would imply. But Poaching mortality rates on adult resident females in excess of 15% is going to negate all other efforts to recover tiger numbers. And we both really like this slide. In India, tigers live on isolated islands in a sea of humanity. And in Russia, humans live in isolated islands surrounded by tigers in a sea of tiger habitat. So this is the Korean pine and oak forests where tigers walk. It's so amazing to me to be in this, which reminds me a little bit of Vermont and New Hampshire, and to think that you could just come across a tiger. So the trends in Siberian tiger populations have changed dramatically over the past 70 years, and actually recently uh, for the better. Um, Siberian tigers were almost completely extirpated in Russia, well extinct, and really due to intensive hunting. So in the 1940s, there were 20 to 40 animals left. Hunting was prohibited in 1947, and the tiger population is somewhere around uh, 500 currently. So uh, this is our friend Sasha. He is acting like a tiger. He's testing the capture cameras for tigers. We also had an opportunity to go out with uh, several times with Svetlana Suchirina, who is a amur tiger biologist. And here, we also went out with um, Silver, Silverback Films' Kieran O'Donovan, and he was scouting as the front cameraman uh, for an epic, nature epic that's being funded by Netflix, and he was looking for places to set up a tiger blind. So we went with him in the field scouting for those sites. So this is a capture camera image of tigers. They are identified by their stripe patterns. Um, so they're not snare trapping to estimate population size. They're not using snare traps any longer. They are using camera traps because they can identify individual tigers that way. Uh, when we were there, um, there was a tiger kill of uh, an adult Sika deer. And um, this was in an empty territory. The female tiger had been poached a year previously, and so the biologists were very excited, hoping that this was a female tiger who was coming in to claim this territory on the preserve. So, you know, these cats are formidable predators, um, 
and the cats. There was a lot of abundant um, boar sign, and boar are one of the tiger's main preys. Uh, this is uh, the largest subspecies of boar in this area. The thing that really astounded me is their tusks can be up to 11 inches in length. So on the left is uh, tiger biologist Sasha, and on the right is Dale McHale, who is with the Wildlife Conservation Society and has been living in Russia for 20 plus years, as we mentioned. And they're here on a recent tiger kill of a young boar. And so they were checking to see if any of the camera traps had caught any images, but there were no images. So we did run, come, come across tiger tracks. And this is probably either a female or a young subadult. It would be significantly larger if it were a male. And then one. Uh, so we were seeing tracks, and one day we were walking on some trails, checking camera traps, and we actually, there were tracks, tiger tracks in the mud, and we got to a point where we could actually smell the tigers. So they had just been there. And we checked the camera, camera trap, and this is what was, uh, this was the image. So this is a F Siberian female and her cubs. We can play that again. Maybe we'll play that one more time since Amher Tigers are Amher Tigers. Yeah, we, like Andrew said, we were so close to them we could we could smell them. And it was nice to go back to the um, uh, camera trap and um, and play the footage that it had captured and, and know the, the tigers that we were smelling. Yeah, they'd just been there. So cubs are dependent on their mothers for 15 months. They disperse at that time, but they are already beginning to hunt about six months of age. Um, I'm just checking out the scent marks, so they, they do scent mark, they um, mark the boundaries of their territories with urine and scrapes and spray scent. And that's how they communicate with other tigers and let tigers know that they this is their territory, etc. Russia is very, very um, lovely, I think I would say, about um, having tea time breaks uh, in the field. So we would build a campfire and sit around and have tea and picked berries and it was it was very nice, a great way to um, collaborate. Well, you know, even even when we were uh, at Kazan at the uh, preserve at the headquarters uh, uh, during the work day, uh, around the office, people would take time to have tea together. And it was it was great. So we were lucky enough, um, very very fortunate to meet this man, Igor Nikolaev. Um, he and his partner, Anatoly Yudikov, they were biology partners. They would studied tigers together, and uh, for five years, they documented Amur tiger ecology from 1969 to 1974. They are credited with much of the information that we recognize today regarding tiger biology and behavior. Um, Yudikov died in 1974. A very dramatic story goes with that after a tree fell on him. Um, and Dale McHale says that there will never be another study such as what these two Russian biologists did because of the huge amount of intensive and extremely difficult field time uh, and their dedication to their work and the vast amounts of data that they gathered. Yeah, if you can imagine, uh, these guys in Siberia and um, uh, in the winter time, uh, they would get on a, a, a set of tiger tracks and follow them day and night uh, for a week or two, uh, just living off the, the, what they had in their packs, uh, managing to stay warm somehow, uh, and trekking through the snow in the Siberian winter. 
So I'm just, we're, we're going to wrap this up pretty quickly. I'm just going to introduce you very briefly to some of the species that um, live in the Seacoat Alene Biosphere Reserve. This is a long-tailed goral. It is in the tribe with North American mountain goats. We went looking multiple times, climbing up in these steep cliffs, but we never did get a view of one, but we sure had fun looking. Um, this is us looking for a goral. Oh, and we uh, went out with a musk deer researcher. She was a biologist, but she was also working on her uh, master's degree, uh, Dasha Maximova. Uh, and she had a reputation among other biologists for being quite um, uh, the field person, comfortable being out in the woods and uh, around all the, the creatures out there. Um, uh, we really enjoyed being in the field with her. This is her. Uh, she had some a few... Uh, a few of her musk deer with uh, radio transmitters on them. You guys were talking about something here. I don't remember <laughs> what it was. Um, Just chat. I, I'm sure it's philosophical. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, it was quite a pleasure to be out with her. Uh, she led us to uh, one of her musk deer. Uh, these guys have some uh, tusks. No antlers, but they have tusks. So, uh, so musk deer prefer this uh, high elevation pine forest, and they do get taken by tigers once in a while. Um, they browse on lichens. Um, they're tiny, and they also are prey to the uh, smaller but rather savage Indian marten, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so they call this. This is uh, the musk deer before in the previous shot was a musk deer that they had collared. Um, and males do not have antlers. Uh, they do have these prominent tusk-like canines that you can see that can grow up to about four inches, and these are for dominance display. Um, but I want to say they um, are threatened again by. Um, they're poached for their musk glands, um, and they that can fetch prices as high as forty-five thousand U.S. per kilogram. So again, I said these were small animals; they weigh around seven kilograms, around fifteen pounds. And poaching is is a, is a problem. Well, and true to uh, Dasha's reputation, uh, we were hiking back to the cabin and. Uh, she made a real quick step and suddenly she reached down and she pulled up this extremely poisonous snake and she was just perfectly comfortable with the whole thing uh, and it happened so fast. Alright, so just a couple of more quick slides. So I want to talk about these yellow-throated martins. We had not uh, been introduced to these before. They are diurnal, but they can be active at night. Unlike most mustelids, which are solitary, these guys are not. They move and hunt in groups of two or three, and they're very successful hunting prey together, including the musk deer that we just um, looked at. So they travel on the ground, but they can climb trees, and they can travel from tree to tree by jumping. So they're up to 13 pounds in weight. So that was a new one for us. This is a taxidermy mount of a stellar sea eagle. So you can see the size of these guys. This is one of Europe's rarest species of woodpecker, the white-backed woodpecker, which we happen to see. A little bunting. The uh, great crested grebes, which were beautiful, were out on the lake on the uh, preserve, largest grebe in Europe. We did see the black woodpecker. Um, this has a 30-inch wingspan, beautiful glossy black. We didn't get a photo, so we pulled this off of archive. It's a lot like the pileated woodpeckers in the States. It feeds on insects. And then this was our favorite. We didn't see this either, although we went looking. This is Blackiston's fish owl. It's an eagle owl with a wingspan of 2 meters. It wades in streams to catch fish and crabs. It has a very small, rapidly declining population due to widespread loss of riverine uh, forest, increasing development along the rivers, and dam construction. So it is threatened. An owl waiting around. I mean, that's really um, behavior unbecoming of an owl, wouldn't you say? But uh, you got to love them. 
So this is a, we ran into a Himalayan bear swimming about 200 meters off the coast in the Japanese Sea. Just a couple of shots of him. And for those of you that don't recognize it, it's this, this is not our photo, but it's the bear with the, the moon shape on its chest. There are also Eurasian lynx Oops, in we this. Out of the program. Oh. Look, looks like our PowerPoint program crashed. Um, but we're, we're what do we have? We're, Just a couple of more. A couple of more. Yeah. Um, Just a look? Sure. Where's the presentation? Oh, it's stuck, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, John. FYI, guys, we can we can still hear you just fine and see your screen, so we're not we're not frozen over here. Oh, you're not. Okay. Well, then. Yeah, we, we can see you just fine. Uh, what slide are you seeing? Are you seeing a cat or? A... Uh, we still see the first slide. It looks like is the PowerPoint itself not responding right now. That's yeah. right. It's not. We've got the uh, spinning globe here. Mm, okay. Spinning globe uh, of day. Um, all right. Let's spend a minute or so trying to get it up, and if not, then uh, we'll you go know, picture we just, this for the last few slides. We've just got a couple of slides, so should all we right. just proceed with that? Can we can we plug this? Get into this? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. I join you have control? Yeah, I have control now. I'm just trying to force quit here. Okay, so it's quit. Okay. Yeah. Way down towards the end. Yeah. Forward or back? Be forward, towards the end. All right. Way to the end. Way Let's to the end. See, now you can back up a little bit. Yeah. We're somewhere in, yeah, right in here. Okay, I'll hit play. Okay. And you guys take control back. Great. We're almost finished. Thanks for your assist. All right, lynx. I tell you, yeah. So the other animal that we found most interesting were these raccoon dogs, which actually are a member of the Canidae family, the only member of that family that hibernates. We saw a dead one of these, but didn't see a live one. Eurasian red squirrels, and then we're just wrapping up quickly here. Um, Mitya's father, Yuri Gorshkov, and his wife, uh, who are, were our original collaborators. Um, Yuri was the is the director of the Volga Kama National Nature Preserve in Russia, and we did our original research with him um, and his wife Tatiana. They came from Kazan to Turney uh, to see us while we were there, so that was wonderful. Uh, this is Mitya's office on the preserve with the University of Montana Western Diploma in the center. So this is our this is our family, our Russian family, so to speak, Mitya and his wife Olga and their daughters Anastasia and Dasha and Anya. This is Dasha the tiger. And we just have some acknowledgments. Yes, well, we'd really like to thank St. George's University for providing us with a sabbatical uh, to take advantage of this and also the travel funds to, um, uh, to go to the conference that was there at uh, Sikotaling Preserve. Um, also, Dmitry Gorshkov, uh, you know, lined us up with, uh, with folks on all these preserves and um, uh, he has a tremendous network in, in all of Russia, actually, to, uh, for nature preserves. And, um, and he lined up accommodations for us at some places. Um, and let's see. And then also the people of the various preserves that we uh, visited that were just uh, so accommodating. And Dale McHale. Yeah, well, yes. Conservation mm -hmm. Society. That's it. Alrighty then, guys. Well, thank you very much. It was very interesting yeah. to, to receive that content and context mm -hmm. as it relates to, to wildlife conservation, particularly as it relates to a region of the world that I'm not sure that I myself 
are very familiar with or even mm -hmm. those of us that are participating in this course as well. Mm -hmm. So certainly it would have been a, a learning experience for, for yeah, all of us. Yeah. I know it hopefully it also put some perspective onto the into the current debates and discussions going on in at least in the media with regards to Russia. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> and to recognize that it's a yeah. quite a beautiful country. Oh, oh and it is and, and, and also the, the whole thing about how you know nations are out there doing their posturing and what have you but when it comes to on a personal level how uh, relations can be so much different and I think we all need some wildlife experience and exposure mm -hmm. you know, just to just to really even recognize the the magnitude of, of of the presence and and their purpose as well in the environment that we share with them yeah. Yeah. what we would like to do now guys um is open up the, the, the floor essentially for, for you to interact, questions, comments, discussions as well as related to, to the presentation, but also on the topic of wildlife conservation as well. And I'd like to begin the discussion as well um, as it relates to this whole issue of wildlife conservation. So you guys have been able to travel to different parts of the world and you recognize wildlife as being a, a significant challenge in terms of their sustainability itself um which factor which factors do you think are the most significant contributor to these challenges to wildlife and why do factors are primarily anthropocentric factors mm -hmm. well um there are there are several different factors that drive the processes of extinction in mm -hmm. these species there are stochastic factors which are sort of random chance factors um, that impact species, um, environmental stochasticity, genetic stochasticity, demographic stochasticity. Those kinds of factors kick in when populations get very small. Like mm -hmm. when you're looking at a population like the Amur leopard and you're talking about 40 to mm -hmm. 60 um, leopards left, um, a disease coming through the population or a forest fire, or some, something that is kind of a random vector mm -hmm. can really do the population in. Where is with a, a population with much much greater numbers, that's not going to have the impact. Um, so th those are there are a lot of different stochastic factors happening, um, t and then there are deterministic factors that are those factors that we humans actually have a little more control over, like hunting regulations and habitat, and whether you know whether we're destroying all their habitat or whether we're not, we're setting some aside, those kinds of things. So, uh, and depending on where you are in the world and what's happening, I mean, honestly, for a lot of our charismatic megafauna around the world, I mean, it, just to be perfectly frank, elephants um, in 1978, there were 1.3 million elephants across continental Africa. We are down below 400,000. That is a steep, steep decline over a very short period of time and that does not bode well for for long-term viability of the elephant at this point and the driving factor there is poaching yeah just a few years ago 400,000 elephants and uh, being poached at 25,000 a year uh, that gets 16 years at best uh, from that point yeah. Uh, and probably what it's increased to like 30,000 now, hasn't it? Um, at least yeah. I saw a figure like that uh, uh, not too long ago. Yeah. Um, so it, it's not long uh, for the, some of these animals. And the health of ecosystems, and ultimately the health of human, the human populations, are going to be dependent on the health of our environment and the health of our ecosystems, and all of these organisms that interact within these ecosystems, as we sort of unravel that, it's like taking apart a beautiful Indian rug, we're unraveling it piece by piece and we end up with these little tiny patches and we've lost that, that piece, that whole unique And several of these, these species of animals are a keystone species themselves. Mm -hmm. So their contribution to the ecosystem equilibrium and management is essential right. and yeah. without their presence we can potentially face the consequences of ecosystem failures yeah. and and what does that mean for the human population in terms of access to food mm -hmm. in terms of, of, of sustainable land use and management as well as the proliferation of other species right. which can serve as pests 
and source of diseases for right. different populations as well. So what happens is we, as we continue to <clears throat> make inroads into habitats and causing issues and ha with habitats and climate change, all these things that are impacting these species, the species that will survive out there are what we call the generalists. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, generalists are species that really can survive across broad ranges and broad environments like black rats, ratus ratus, ratus norwegicus, um, coyotes, those kinds of things. It's the specialists that we will begin to lose because they're tied specifically to uh, hummingbirds might be tied to specific plants, butterflies tied to specific plants, and as we do away with those plants, then we will lose those specialist species which really help keep an ecosystem whole. And, and then there's a moral ethical question too about us mm -hmm. sort of not not leaving room for and saving space for the other species on this planet. We do have a few bright spots out there, you know. We do. I mean, the, <laughs> we do. There are some bright spots. You know, like the leopards <laughs> have been increasing slowly, and the mirror tigers have uh, increased mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, not so the elephants. Uh, but American bald eagles have been delisted. And, Peregrine falcons have been uh, delisted. Yeah. Uh, uh, grizzly bears are doing very well in the mm -hmm. uh, lower 48 states. Um, so there, there are some bright spots. Mm -hmm. okay, so any questions? Yeah, we do. So before I get to the questions, let me just remind everyone um, there are two ways that you can ask questions. One is if you have a question, just chat it in the uh, chat area, and uh, we'll ask your question for you. And the second is uh, if you raise your hand, we can try to bring you on the mic and you can talk to the presenters. Um, and I know that uh, we'll start with Nikoyan, who's been waiting very patiently. Uh, Nikoyan, your hand is up. So if you want to come on the mic, just uh, unmute yourself. And uh, I think you have a couple questions starting with the tiger. So uh, go ahead. Hi, Nikoyan. Uh, might be some mic issue, so I'll scroll up and uh, and find Nikoyan's question and ask. Uh, so Nikoyan uh, had asked, uh, how do these tigers support or challenge the ecosystem that they are an integral part of? And that was, uh, I think, during the um, uh, you know the section about uh, tigers in there. So tigers are a keystone predator. And keystone predators are critical to ecosystems in which they are a member of. And they are part of what helps to keep um, a natural ecosystem in balance. I think we've seen so much manipulation of that particular ecosystem and so much poaching of the prey animals that the tigers prey on. Tigers would act to keep those prey populations in some kind of balance with the ecosystem. And a good example of that is, is the removal of um, um, wolves from Yellowstone Park years and years ago, and now they have been reintroduced. And in the ensuing time after wolves were removed and before wolves, so they're a top keystone predator also, before they were reintroduced, uh, the boom of the ungulate populations and the decimation of habitat, which then was detrimental to birds and insects and everybody that th those organisms that were depending on those habitats that were decimated by the ungulates. So tigers can act to keep um, prey populations in check. In an area like this where there has been so much manipulation, so much logging, a lot of poaching of the prey animals, the ecosystem is what I would say out of balance mm -hmm. anyway. Um, but, but the goal of wildlife biologists and conservation biologists and ecologists would be to, to, to help bring this ecosystem back into balance by increasing predator and prey populations, and, which is what they were trying to do with Yellowstone. And I, I think that ties into a follow-up question that is here from Nikoyan as well, and it asked if there are any local practices, policies, uh, or legislation that protect the wildlife in the region uh, against poaching or any other negative anthropological impacts. And by that, you, I was wondering if she was meaning the Caribbean region, or is she speaking from a United States perspective? I believe Nikoyan is from Grenada. Uh, 
Uh, I see that in one of her comments. And so could you repeat that last? Uh, you, she's uh, Nikoya, and I don't know if you're a male or female. I apologize for that. So I will call Nikoya and they. Um, but asking, uh, looks like for a U.S. perspective, and the question was, I'll repeat it, it was, uh, are there any local practices, policies, or legislation that protect the wildlife in this region against poaching or any negative anthropological impacts? Well, there, there are a few regulations on the books, uh, but uh, very little in the way of enforcement. Um, and so I, I would say that really it's, um, uh, there's not, there's not meaningful enforcement. I, I, I think, you know, we ought to qualify that in, in that, that I'm afraid the poachers, so that this preserve, the tiger, tiger country backs right up to the Chinese border and tigers are poached for traditional mm -hmm. medicinal Chinese medicine, as are the Amur leopards. And unfortunately, the, the number of guards protecting these animals are f far less than the numbers of poachers coming across the borders. And that's true in Africa, too. And in, in Africa, you know, we're, we, we lose, actually, we lose guards who are killed by poachers, guards that are protecting rhinoceros and elephants. So um, it, it's... It, it, it really, what we have to have is a complete paradigm shift and in terms of people's attitudes towards um, animals and the way that they treat animals, and that may not happen in time for, for many of these larger species. Wow. Uh, interestingly, the, the author, Aldo Leopold, wrote that, that, that humans, we should consider ourselves as stewards of the environment. Yes. And, and having this, this role and this, this yeah. peak presence in, in an ecosystem, yep. we have a particular responsibility of yep. ensuring that they're protected, that they're, that they're looked after as well. So it all depends on, on, your, on your perspective and that's where perception comes in. Yep. So you can have as much legislation and enforcement as you want if, if, if the mindset is that these animals are dispensable to, for, for particular uses without checks and balances, then that we are seeing results of that. Yeah. So to the question is how do we really go about changing uh, the the actions and perceptions which will inform uh, the the conservation types of behavior that is essential. Mm -hmm. That's that's a challenge. When sometimes even people in the world today they they have difficulty even connecting with the environment right. because the way they live and the way they grew up in in, in life yeah. the value association that is placed yeah. right. with with the wild. It's not there. You know, I think the only one of one of the ways that we're finding that actually does work is to engage local communities in in the protection of these species, and in engaging them, you're also hiring them, and they can, you know, if they can't feed their children, they're not going to be protecting mm -hmm. elephants. But if they can be engaged in caring for these animals and um, monitoring what's happening and that kind of thing. Uh, that that's a workable solution. Mm -hmm. Aldo Leopold also said he he, he said uh, since you brought him up, mm -hmm. he said you know there are two things that humans should should never do. We should never reduce the natural productivity of the mm -hmm. land, and we should never willingly and knowingly push an animal into extinction. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so he's you know he was killed in 1947 in a brush fire. So he's mm -hmm. been long gone, but his mm -hmm. thoughts are still mm -hmm. still there. Yeah. And so, uh, in, if you can find a way to incorporate those values into the local moral fabric, um, that's uh, the very most effective way. And, and things like uh, Tiger Day, where people, the public, are participating in these parades and celebrating the tiger, suddenly uh, it becomes a bad thing to be uh, killing tigers. And um, so, maybe with kids involved as well. Yeah, and little because kids. Mm -hmm. Kids are the ones who will probably yeah. question and, and evoke emotions. Mm -hmm. And they're the when ones that yeah. they're developing their sense of morality yeah. at that yeah. exactly. young age. Yeah. And it's very difficult to change that once a yeah. person gets older. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah um, let's, uh, let's, let's try the mic again. I see a hand up from Makeda. Uh, Makeda, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. I know your hand's been up for a little while. Thank you.
Hey, Makeda. Some microphone issue kind of day. Makeda, are you there? Uh, if not, we'll, we'll go on to the next one, but uh, I'll give you a couple seconds. This is Makeda from Grenada. <laughs> All right. Well, McKay, uh, if you come back, just uh, just just go ahead and chat something in the box. But let's move on to uh, maybe. Uh, well, hang on a second. Let me let me try this, Makeda, Here. I'm getting word that the microphone might be automatically muted. Uh, Makeda, try uh, uh, try now. Tell me yourself. I just I just changed something. All right, we'll move on. Let me get back to it. Uh, let's try uh, Jerry. Jerry has his hand up. Jerry, it looks like we can hear you now. Hey, Jerry, we can hear you. Hi. Hey, Jerry. Interesting presentation, Dr. Pilcher. Um, hey, Jerry. Commenting on one of the, the, the earlier questions in regarding policies and legislation for protecting of ecosystems and so on. In a lot of cases, the drive for whatever fur or whatever um, timber, that's a lot of the time the, the main driving force behind habitat destruction is a want of that particular resources, whether it's a, a, a bird for a pet or so on. In a lot of the cases, that's where the environmental management needs to take place. It's curtailing that, that urge and um, illegal trade and so on that leads to that habitat destruction. So that was just a comment I had regarding you know, ecosystem management is a lot of times it's the, the drive for that resources that that causes that destruction. Yeah, thanks for that. So then we have to look at the whole economics mm -hmm. of, of, of the products that are derived from wildlife and see how we can adjust the pricing structures and and the market demands. To, 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 to reduce the, the likelihood of, of harvesting these animals as, as, as a source of income. Yeah. Uh, next we have Tremaine. I've unmuted you, Tremaine. Uh, I noticed you also texted your question as well. Do you want to uh, come on to the mic? Tremaine, are you there? Hello. Hi. Hello. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Hello. Hi, Jermaine. Good afternoon. Hi, Jermaine. Hi. Hi, Dr. Pilcher and Dr. Pilcher. How are you guys doing? Oh, oh we're doing, doing well, well Jermaine. Nice to hear your voice. Same here. I just have a quick question. We have had a few residents who had some small snakes, like vocal constrictors and so on, and they got big and they released them into, into the environment and they're, you know, they're scaring residents because they just turn up anywhere. How do we, like, is there a policy against this or... Can some call somebody to have them like hunt the snakes down? Because once they, you know, they attack someone, you know, they're pretty dangerous. Yeah, it's hard to know, Tremaine, what kind of snakes. If they, you know, we we have a problem with people releasing invasive snakes that aren't aren't native to an area, and that's a bad thing all the way around for the uh, fauna and flora in that ecosystem. The release of boas and the Everglades is a good example yeah. mm -hmm. um, and they can wreak havoc on um, oh the, you know really the best example is the uh, well in um, in Guam the brown tree snake mm -hmm. and when that brown tree snake came down it came off the guy wires of a ship came onto the island of Guam, and Guam was um, had been isolated from those kind of predators, the birds on Guam, and so there were several flightless birds, and they nest on the ground, and you can imagine, they, 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 not only did they not recognize the danger, they didn't recognize snakes as danger, because that's not, that wasn't in their evolutionary history, but you could see biologists could track the waves of extinction of these birds starting in the port area of that island and just moving north on the island as that snake prolif proliferated across the islands. And it was a while before they actually identified it for the bird-eating snake that it was, and they had misidentified it. And so, Tremaine, I, I have no idea what kinds of snakes you're, that have been released, and if they're not native snakes, it's never, I mean, you, you just want to get rid of them. That's not a good thing. So, 
And so I, they, I, I, I don't, I'm not a capturer of snakes, so I, I've held snakes in my time, but I wouldn't really, it would depend on the snake, the methodology that you would have to use. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome, you Jermaine. Jermaine. Take care. Ellen is on. Ellen has kissed a brown snake in Guam on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an exact I, I guess she's lucky. I don't know. <laughs> um, all right, let's uh, let's try let's try Makeda again. Uh, Makeda, I think at this point you can unmute yourself. And uh, if it doesn't work this time, we'll uh, we have a question in the in the chat. Okay. okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna lower your I'm gonna lower your hand here. Um, okay. We have a question in the chat that comes from Lorna Dale. Um, first of all, Lorna Dale says uh, thank you. Very informative and interesting presentation. Uh, the question is, how is the university involving? I assume St. George's University involving the Grenadian community in regards to protecting the environment and the wildlife conservation regarding policies, education, et cetera, since community involvement is key in those areas along with education. You know, I, I think this is one of our great success stories at SGU, actually. And, and that is through the undergraduates Marine Wildlife and Conservation Biology program. I'm going to speak specifically to that. But that program has um, become fairly popular and um, we have a, a research that's sort of an experiential learning, hands-on research way of handling that program. And so the students are involved in research um, with um, some endangered and threatened species. We've done research with the Grenada hook-billed kite, which is endemic, critically endangered, maybe 60 birds left on the island. Um, so um, we've done butterfly research. And, and what's happened um, is that our graduates are moving out into the government agencies and the NGOs and they're going on to graduate school and funded graduate schools and they're bringing their expertise back and I think that sort of moving out into the island that way and being engaged, we're engaged with forestry, we do projects with forestry, a lot of our marine students are ending up in fisheries and marine protected area work. So I I think we've really made some inroads um, along those lines in terms of conservation across Grenada. Yeah, in their uh, in their work, uh, they're working with uh, with schools. They're running summer camps and the like, and so uh, they are uh, dealing with uh, young people a lot. Yeah, the other piece of that is the education conservation outreach. The undergraduate uh, group that's that's sort of housed in the Department of Biology. Those kids are very active um, students. They're not kids. These young people are really active um, going out into the schools, doing presentations um, about the unique natural heritage of Grenada to the school children. So I think they've been very active that way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that uh, clears out the queue for the chat questions and the uh, uh, the hands raised. So um, perhaps give it a few more seconds. And uh, Dr. Bays, if you want to uh, give any closing thoughts or wrap up. So I would actually like to explore this this topic as as we examine the whole issue of environmental changes that that are that we're grappling with. I mean, in the Caribbean, we have recent and current experiences in terms of the increasing intensity. Uh, the frequency, the duration of mm -hmm. adverse weather conditions, mm -hmm. including hurricanes in, in, in the region. How, how, how does adverse environmental events, whether it's natural disaster, how does that impact wildlife as well? And as islands of the Caribbean are struggling now to even recover, mm -hmm. what does that also mean in terms of wildlife species there? Mm -hmm. Now, certainly a lot of habitats destroyed, a lot of forest is removed, uh, mangroves, what have you. Uh, reefs can be hammered uh, with all the wave action. Um, and then, of course, there's all the, 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 the flooding and uh, erosion that takes place. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, there's, there's quite an impact. Mm -hmm. And what will it take then to not necessarily return to but to reestablish the presence 
and the contributions of wildlife into the ecosystem? Uh, boy, a lot of it's time. I mean, we can help some things along. We can do some plantings and some critical areas, and, you know, try to reestablish uh, some habitat that way. Uh, maybe more protection, uh, you know, uh, from legally. And uh, would you add something to that? That sounds, that sounds pretty good. I mean, you know, we become, we need to become facilitators mm -hmm. of ecosystem recovery. And that's a whole, a whole area of ecology is um, ecosystem recovery and rehabilitation. So there's lots of knowledge out there about how to do that, and that's that's what's going to have to begin to happen. You know, and you may, like Brian said, there may need to be restrictions on take of wildlife for a while that you you would leave them alone as they recover. Certainly. School children planting mangrove seedlings is always a good thing. They like getting down and dirty in the mud, and then they make a real contribution. And so there's ways of involving the community in these things, and these, these recovery efforts as well. But the bottom line is we're going to see more and more of this in the future unless we can get a handle on climate change. So maybe as part of disaster preparedness plans, for example, mm -hmm. when we Examine the whole issue of building codes, evacuation strategies of people, looking right. now at how pets are actually involved in those plans. Maybe we have to also consider and cater right. for the wildlife species yeah. as well. How do yeah. we try to protect them? Yeah. How do we try to, I mean, even if we are if we're evacuating people and pets, yeah. we have to consider wildlife as well and return them yeah. into, the, into, into the environment, depending. So maybe all of these need to be considered. Mm -hmm. If I were to, let's say, for some reason, I had some wishes to grant. If, I would, if you guys had like a wish list of, let's say, three wishes for the wildlife species you have worked with in different parts of the world, what would those wishes be? Mm, interesting question. <laughs> you know, I guess um, mine would be for that paradigm shift that I talked about, and that's going to take some major, major doing. But, but that's what really has to happen, is we have to have a sea change in the way that we think about and utilize species. And, yeah. Do you ever think that we return to, to, to the environments and, and the species presence that we were accustomed to decades ago? I, you know, I think we're, we're, we're a very managed landscape mm -hmm. yeah. at this point. Yeah. So for me, it really comes down to, you know, I, I feel like um, I don't want to be a part of that generation that future generations look, back, <laughs> look at and say, where were you when the yeah. elephant was going under? Yeah. Where were you when the Amur leopard went under? What were you doing? You know, I'd like to be, um, so, but that all is, a, it's a big, complicated yeah. question. Yeah, and so part of that uh, shift, uh, I mean, it's just so heart-rending uh, to see these charismatic megafauna, as we call them, you know, the large um, the large animals that, uh, that really grab our attention. It's really heart-rending to see them going so quickly, and if part of that paradigm shift could capture, um, you know, a diminished poaching so that they would have a chance to survive, that would be big for me. But the, the, the human populations in these areas are oftentimes suffering also. Yeah. And and so this and this is so it is very complicated. So we have to intertwine the two in our management strategies. Absolutely. Or it, we won't win. Yeah. The elephant in the garden uh, isn't exactly the <laughs> you know um, get the love of the local farmer. Uh, I think those are very, very thought-provoking comments, to, and especially within the context of One Will, One Health, and One Medicine. Mm -hmm. We're really seeking to examine and to explore the, the cohabitation and the inextricable linkages yep. between humans, animals, and environment, not just from a disease perspective, but also from a, from a living perspective. Culture. Culture perspective. From, from religion. Or, all aspects of, of, yep. of humanity. So, so I believe that this topic ties in very nicely in the overall theme of One Will, One Health, One Medicine. You, what you guys have actually evoked in our minds is the fact that while we think about controlling diseases, 
that are source of animals, we also have to think about protecting these animals. Hunt diseases, yes, but protecting them from us <laughs> mm -hmm. at the same time, and the environmental factors that, that they're prone to as well. So it's a, it's a very challenging, but it's very topical, but it's very relevant. Yeah. And I, I suspect that if, I mean, if the time is here, the time is now. The time is now. For us <laughs> to, to take action. And, and that window of opportunity may no longer exist in, in, in the short, shortest frame of time. Mm -hmm. So we really need to, to, to sort of like get together and, and continue this conversation yes. leading to action mm -hmm. as it relates to wildlife conservation as well. So thank you guys very much for your presentation. You're welcome. Pleasure to it's be fun. here. It's a pleasure and, to be and, here. And sharing your, 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 your travels, your work, and, and, and your significant contributions in the area of wildlife conservation. While it is sometimes that you guys would have noted the, the stresses and challenges for it, you would have also alluded to examples mm -hmm. and successes. Mm -hmm. So we have to take some with the other at the same yeah. time. Yeah. You know. Well, thank you guys once again for joining us on the September version of our One World One Health One Medicine course. We encourage you to enroll at online.sgu.edu forward slash anniversary, where you will receive a recording of this seminar as well as other content which is connected to the theme of ecosystem health and wildlife conservation as well. Well, that's it for now. We have to thank our, our team, John Swoop online, Donna Walker on site, and myself, Satish Badesi. Well, until our next time, keep well, and we will see you guys in October for another installment of One Wolf, One Health, and One Medicine. Goodbye for now. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Got some thank yous coming in on the chats. Have a good one. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah. you managed. Are we off?